Now, for somebody like myself, who has spent years on YouTube, almost a decade now, in large part making my chops, knocking the WWE, criticizing the WWE, ranting and raving and bitching about the WWE, you know, when they give me something good, I really don't know how to react sometimes. I look at like what happened with last week's SmackDown. I really, really enjoyed that show. It, was all, it almost made me kind of uncomfortable. It was kind of cool. Get out of your comfort zone a little bit. But having to think to myself, you know, as much as our new hero, our new top babyface, the most important and interesting person in professional wrestling right now, Roman Reigns, is leading the charge. You have to assume SmackDown is going to be good. They couldn't possibly match what they did last week this week, could they? Could they? To my surprise, it kind of got close again. And of course, it all started out because of our great hero, Roman Reigns. Him and Paul Heyman and Jey Uso in the ring. I appreciate the nods to both the business history with Paul Heyman going back when you're talking about Jay's dad and the work they had in WCW over three decades ago. I appreciate the nods to family history, you know, seeing all the family pictures, all that other stuff that, you know, you've seen posted. It, it's really, really cool. And, and even once you have the real heels in this situation, the Butcher Sheamus and King Corbin come out and interrupt this family business, this family matter, whining and pissing and moaning like typical entitled white people do. How dare you? That's nepotism. I won't complain if it's benefiting me, but if it benefits anybody else, oh my God, I'm going to rant and rave about it. Of course, they have to cowardly and savagely try to attack Jey Uso. And some of you, I know, you little smart asses, you little shits, are going to sit there and ask, well, why didn't Roman jump in and help? You know what? He's trying to give Jay some tough love. He knows that Jay's getting ready to main event a pay-per-view contending for a singles world championship. It's a whole different level of things. And he knows as a result that that's going to present the greatest challenge of Jay's life. So what better way to help out here than let him figure things out on his own? And he did. And unlike one of those glory hogs, such as a Hogan or such as a Cena, Roman sat in the background and let Jay get his shine and didn't even fully object when Jay just went and pounded himself to declare a tag match for later on in the night. That's heroic type of stuff. Putting ego aside for business, family, and the greater good. How could you possibly hate that man? And I know what you're going to say. You're, you're praising Roman Reigns in 2020 is the sign of the times. No, that's not the sign of the times. Me and the fact that I'm using hashtag I stand with Sammy, that should be an indication of the times. Because everything he's saying is absolutely right. Why are we saying that Jeff Hardy and AJ Styles is for the Intercontinental Championship? It should be a non-title match because it shouldn't be Jeff Hardy as the Intercontinental Champion. He's a fraud and he's a phony. Sammy Zayn never lost his title. There's no more 30-day rule. We've lessened that stipulation out of existence. So the fact the guy takes a little sabbatical, so what? He can still be champion when he returns. That's ridiculous. So it's not surprising to see that Sammy reached his boiling point and attacked both of these men. I stand with Sammy. Yeah, that's right. It's 2020. It's a sign of the times. I said it. I meant every damn word of it. I also appreciate, in a kind of snarky way, when Jeff kind of collapsed and they did the whole dehydration update angle, like the little rib towards Matt and AEW, uh, certainly not lost on all of us. It gave me a little quick, like, <laughs> chuckle. Let's keep it moving. The Street Profits coming to SmackDown. They took over the Champions Lounge. They created a distraction, helping Lucha House Party beat Shinsuke and Cesaro. You know, usually when you would see this type of stuff on Raw, it would be the same matches happening numerous times. And then at the same time, it would be the guy, the team would still win. And then here comes the Titan Tron stuff. We didn't do that here. Much, much better execution. You know, more of the type of thing that you would expect, creating some heat leading to their match next week, where it's going to be raw and in your face, in your face, raw. Because now we realize our ratings are really going to go in the toilet for Raw, going up against Monday Night Football. So now we got to actually give a crap. Like, what the hell is that stuff? Terry Flay. One of the big things, obviously, on this night was going to be, what was Bailey going to say? 
How is she going to address her actions with what she did to uh, Sasha Banks? And I thought she hit this out of the park. I really did. I've never been a huge fan of Bailey's promo work. Babyface heel does not matter. Um, but it was short. It was sweet. It was to the point, and everything made sense. You know, that Sasha was using her, and she was using Sasha. And Sasha used her to become two belts Banks, and Bailey was using her to become two belts Bailey. Understandable. And then she said she attacked Sasha because she knew Sasha was eventually going to do it to her, so she was just proactive and struck first. Totally sensible. So now... For a story that felt like it never ended, you've actually given me a reason to when you eventually get to the point where you're going to have some type of payoff or blow off here, I might actually really care about it and be interested in it. So well done. The only thing that really to me wasn't that well done this week was the number one contender's fatal four-way match. Um, I know a lot of people get kind of annoying with the hashtag Naomi deserves better because it is scripted television at the end of the day. And it's like Naomi's still making decent money. She has a job when a lot of other people and even a lot of people associated with WWE do not. Uh, so let's calm it down a little bit. But if I think about this even just from a kayfabe standpoint, they kind of got a point. The last time I checked, didn't she beat Bailey in a beat the clock challenge a couple of weeks ago? Clean in the middle of the ring? Wouldn't that, by default, technically, using old wrestling logic, give her at least a very strong justification to be the number one contender? A Clash of Champions, or at least, worst case scenario, get her a spot in this number one contender's fatal four-way match? Do you really need to have Lacey Evans and Tamina in there? Did you? Did you really? I'm just saying. It just felt like this match was less about, you know, getting somebody in a spot to take on Bailey at the next pay-per-view. It just felt like it was more about a storyline plot device for um, Alexa Bliss. You know, because at the beginning of the match... When you see them have Nikki Cross get attacked, you're saying, okay, they might have her and Naomi coming at this point. She'll go on to be the number one contender. And they didn't. It was all done just to get some sympathy for Nikki Cross. So that way later on, she can freaking sit there and get taken out by a actually pretty decent looking sister Abigail by Alexa Bliss. Clearly she practiced this. But the reality is, is once Alexa Bliss left this match, all the interest with it, and it all went down very, very quickly. Like, yeah. It was not good. Uh, speaking of women, who's the mystery blonde? I think most people surmise it's Carmella, and understandably so, because that's who it is. I know I was a smart ass on Friday night and tweeted uh, when asked who's the mystery woman. I said it was Emma. That was a dig back at the month of vignettes, if you remember a couple years ago, when Emma, <laughs> they were doing it every single week. And then she's like, I don't like this. I don't want to do this character, and I want to wreck you. Instead of getting a real push in her. I'm sorry, it was funny. Um, some of you wanted to be Eva Marie, you sadistic sons of bitches. Um, I just don't understand what's the big deal about Carmella that you have to hype her up like this. Like, what's going to be the dramatic character change here? I guess we'll find out in due time. I am appreciating the little mini angle they're doing here with Otis and Tucker and Miz and Morrison around the Money in the Bank briefcase, like, in the Money in the Bank contract. You know, it's a way to actually remind us there was a Money in the Bank winner, and Otis was that Money in the Bank winner. And since you're not going to have Otis try to cash in on Roman Reigns anytime soon, you know, might as well figure out something to do for him. And, you know, you could potentially do this to do a couple of different things. You could do this as a situation where Tucker cost Otis the Money in the Bank contract at some point. He turns, that team breaks up, and you launch Otis on his own singles run as a babyface. You know, you could sit there and potentially have Miz and Morrison just flat out win it. You could do the Tucker thing, the Tucker turn, but you could also just have Miz and Morrison win it either way, and then maybe Jomo wins it, and then Miz gets jealous, and they end up battling it out over the Money in the Bank contract. Like, There's a chance here to do some really interesting mid-card stuff around something that matters, something that has significance and meaning. At least they're doing something with the Money in the Bank contract other than just having the same old standard guy walks out with the briefcase every week and you talk about it in the state, same old tried and true, played out way. So that I'm cool with. I was also cool with the Firefly Funhouse this week, even though a lot of you apparently weren't. Now, personally, I would have called them the Portly Palrus, but Wobbly Walrus it is. I mean, it gets me every time the Vince Puppet walks in. 
What in my home is going on here? <laughs> like, I guess this is just me. I like this silly, stupid stuff. I know a lot of you are matching move marks, so this just goes past you. You don't like this. Tough. Not everything has to be about moves and matches. It's nice to have some variety and some spice. At least you got somebody that's a different and interesting character here. You know, so I think it's cool. You know, and, and in the meantime, you're planting the seed of, you know, he's going to come after Roman at some point in time. So that story's not over. You're already doing the J thing right now, and that's cool. You know, we'll see what happens with Alexa Bliss going forward as part of this as well. It's interesting. I guess you got your sister Abigail. Probably not going to like it, but you got it. <laughs> But what's so bad about the Firefly Fun House? Like, people talking about it jumped the shark. Really? After all the other episodes, this is the one where I finally jumped the shark? Really? Really? Come on, man. But that's okay. It was all about the main event anyways. And, and see, heel tactics are the Butcher and King Corbin attacking Jay before the match even begins. Like, not trying to wrestle fair and square, not trying to make this a straight-up competition. You know, they tried to jump Jay before Roman even got down there. And some of you are going to say, well, what took Roman so long to be Andrew his Samoan ass down there? Well, he can't help it that he got delayed. He's a busy man. Lots of priorities. And I can just picture it now that either Kevin Dunn in the production truck or Bruce Pritchard at Gorilla missed their cue. That's not Roman's fault. That's theirs. You can just picture it now. Kevin Dunn sitting there and saying, You know what? I know he's a man, but his hair is just magnificent. Look at his eyes. What a Samoan stun muffin. He is just absolutely gorgeous. And you know him and Bruce Pritchard probably talking about that? And we missed the mark! It happens! Next time, give Kevin Dunn a carrot, and you ain't got to worry about him missing the spot. But even once Roman finally realized what was going on and made sure he came out to the ring, he saw that his cousin was under some distress. Now, some of you are cowardly going to point to, well, Jay finally had the match in hand, and here comes Roman Reigns the glory hog to tag himself in to make sure he gets the pinfall victory. Ah, 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 ah. No, 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 no. We're not going with that fake news spin here, people. He saw and recognized that his cousin was winded. And what he was doing was tagging in to ensure that his cousin got his win and that he could contribute and help his team achieve the pinfall victory. And isn't that exactly what happened? If anything, it's a smart thing to do. And I realize, especially in America, we hate things like science now and we belittle and demean people for showing intelligence. But you're not going to demean Roman Reigns for working smarter versus harder. You're not going to do it on my watch. And even after the match, where of course, Roman and Jay were victorious as everybody could have expected. Roman goes to the top of the ramp. Jay raises his hand. Roman has the belt in his hands. And he sees Jay lost him for it. He got you, fam. He got you. He helped you get this shot. You've earned this shot. Now you're going to realize when you mess with the bull, you're going to get the horns. The horns, he says. I enjoyed SmackDown. Look, they're doing things with characters. It's not just a bunch of unnecessary moves. They're advancing stories, and not just that, but stories that I'm actually interested in, characters that I'm actually interested in. Wrestling doesn't have to be that hard. Like, it doesn't have to be perfect to be good. And for the second week in a row, I thought SmackDown was really good. And we only have one person and one person alone to thank for that. Rinse for a friend. Hell no! Roman Reigns! So you're going to still buy into and believe the propaganda. But that's why OTR Central is not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. Because I'll cut through that biased propaganda spin of WWE and get straight to the truth of the matter, the heart of the matter. The reason SmackDown's been good the past two weeks is because of Roman Reigns. When you're good at the top, everything else gets better downstream. It's that simple.